This is Sciographies, an introduction to the people who make science happen. I'm your host, David Barkley. I'm an oceanographer with the Faculty of Science here at Dalhousie University. And on Sciographies, I interview different types of scientists about what shaped their interests, their career path, and how they get their research ideas. Thanks for joining us. In this episode, we talk to Dr. Kevin Hewitt. He's a physicist working on optical diagnostic tools for disease detection. Dr. Hewitt is also passionate about increasing the representation of black professionals in STEM fields. He was a graduate student when his commitment to this work began with the earliest vision of Imatep's Legacy Academy, which is now a community partnership that helps improve success for grades 6 to 12 students of African heritage in Nova Scotia. As the first Associate Dean of Equity and Inclusion for Dalhousie's Faculty of Science, Dr. Hewitt continues his efforts. And in another first, last month, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada named him an inaugural Atlantic Region Co-Chair for Inclusion in Science and Engineering. Dr. Hewitt talks to us about immigrating to Canada from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, his mother's influence on his success and career path, and pursuing research related to health outcomes for African Canadians. Okay, well, I usually like to start at the beginning, and that's your childhood. (laughs) So I know a little bit about your moving around. You were born in England, but moved to the St. Vincent and the Grenadines pretty young. Yeah, so I was uh, put on a plane at eight months and traveled to St. Vincent uh, to basically live with my grandmother. Uh, My mother at the time came to Canada, so both my sister and I went back home, similar to a lot of my contemporaries. Mm -hmm. It was a great place to grow up, but of course, you know, those first 10 years, I saw neither my mother nor my father. Uh, but my grandmother spoiled me rotten, uh, and I um, was a pretty good student, skipped a grade. Did your mom ever talk about why she wanted to leave the UK? Yeah, so um, at the time, there was uh, discrimination on the basis of race, and mm-hmm. employment and housing was legal. So, right. you know, when she arrived... There were signs on the house saying, you know, we don't accept blacks. Um, and so she went there to train as a nurse. And she had a very difficult time. You know, we're dealing with racism today, but you could just imagine when it was legal in <laughs> in yeah. all aspects, how you know, the difficulty she faced. At the time, there was the domestic scheme under the, the elder Trudeau. Uh, so she took the opportunity to uh, come to Canada, and uh, she first arrived in Montreal briefly, and then to Toronto. Uh, she remarried. Uh, you know, I have two younger brothers, um, and so at ten years old, I left Saint Vincent and met my two younger brothers. Uh, so, what was the move like from uh, Saint Vincent to Canada? Arriving in Canada, you know, I was put back a grade. Uh, Mm -hmm. So that's my first encounter with the education system in Canada, right? Um, uh, And it was a difficult transition from being a top student throughout, you know, the grades in St. Vincent. I was left with sort of pretty poor grades, you know, the Canadian climate was cold, but so was the reception, yeah. right? The N-word was used frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was a, a quite a difficult adjustment. Since you were a top student, I'm assuming you were very academically inclined. You were interested in learning. Did the experience of coming to Canada maybe put your interest elsewhere? Uh, in order to cope with the transition, I started sort of cracking jokes and just yeah. looking back on it. That was an attempt to... Uh, just and also getting involved in sports. Uh, my mother, you know, was facing a difficult time herself with the father of my two youngest siblings. Um, and within the two years that I arrived, we were in a single parent household. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you could imagine that critical time was really a tipping point. I don't want to use a critical point yeah. where you're either going down the right or the wrong path. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had to do summer school in grade 11, is that right? Or? 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, so this is kind of like this, this is this critical point you're talking about, right? Well, so in grade, it was, I think, grade 11 or 12, because we had, of course, to go to grade 13 back then. Mm -hmm. In my second semester of physics, you know, I did poorly. Mm -hmm. I can't recall why. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I uh, pulled my socks up for the uh, last semester yeah. and got a decent grade, but I decided to go to summer school to upgrade. So I, I left um, fully intending to become a medical doctor because my mom was a sure, nurse. Of course. She want, wanted, like many immigrant parents, mm -hmm. right? It's a doctor or engineer. Yeah. So I entered U of T to do biology, had to take a physics course first year, and uh, found that I, you know, it really... Um, aligned with my aptitude to, to tell you the truth you know i could put in the least work with the greatest outcome <laughs> whereas biology was you know memorizing right? sure um whereas the physics was you know analytical thinking and yeah. so on uh, but that first year i was almost on probation i think my gpa was 1.91 yeah <laughs> Um, and, you know, when you think about students nowadays and um, you look at their GPA, you might be wondering, well, why is that? Uh, yeah. So in my case, you know, my mom, single mom, who was um, had a full-time job but also working uh, nights, uh, so she was basically working two jobs in yeah. order to raise four children. Um and so we had to contribute, so I had to uh, find jobs. And uh, so one of the most interesting jobs I had was uh, being a, a zookeeper. I took care of, of uh, African elephants. Mm -hmm. um, okay. One of the most, um, you know, uh, the, on the risk reward spectrum, <laughs> right? It's as you walk in, their yeah. trunks are everywhere, and they all have a personality. Mm -hmm. um, and you're always tested when you come in as a zookeeper, right? Because yeah. there's a hierarchy. Yeah. So anyway, I was also, you know, did bird shows. I was a jewelry salesman. Uh, I was doing so much outside of school trying to mm -hmm. pay for tuition that I was ended up sleeping in some classes sure. and so on. But, yeah. um, but when I encountered physics, as I said, you know, I really took to it. Um, and so I decided to continue with a physics specialist, which is more than a major, okay. uh, and a biology uh, major. So I did okay. basically two degrees, and mm -hmm. that's why I had to take an extra year. Um, mm -hmm. And I always tell students nowadays, you know, one year in the course of your <laughs> entire career is a small. small amount. <laughs> um, yeah. And I'm so glad I did because now I'm combining in my research, you know, that biology sure. and the physics. Sure. What was it like going to U of T? So I was in Scarborough at the time, so yeah. Scarborough campus of University of Toronto. Um, I had two friends, one from, um, one from Turkey, the other from Pakistan, who, you know, we sort of formed a team, mm -hmm. did lots of things together, played squash, and that was really important, right? Yeah. Uh, that reduced, again, the sense of isolation. Yeah. Were they uh, both in physics as well? They were in okay. physics. Yeah. and um, I'm curious. So you and your two friends, you kind of found your identity within the department, let's say, or within the, the university. Were you doing other things outside of school to try and solidify that identity once you, you know, yeah. were in university? Yeah. Yeah, so if you came to my house or drive in my car, you'll see lots of uh, Vincentian flags. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of the things that was really important to my mother is that we have that sense of identity, understand where we've come from. Yeah. Uh, because if you don't have that firm foundation, 
you know, it's very easy to be swayed in one direction or another. Sure. Uh, so she was quite involved in community, right? And remember, this is a woman who's working two jobs mm -hmm. <laughs> and still finding time to contribute to the community. Uh, so one of my first experiences was being a um, counselor for the Harriet Tubman Day Camp. Mm -hmm. At that camp, you know, you're trying to basically share the history of people of African descent to, yep. the, to the campers. So I had to learn a great deal. And mm -hmm. then even when I, of course, left the camp, uh, I was quite involved in creating, um, you know, on-campus groups in order to reduce that sense of isolation. So, yeah. you know, I was president at the African Caribbean Student Association at U of T. Yeah. Again, brought in lots of history and, um, you know, education around the black experience. Uh, when I left uh, U of T, it was my first time away from family. I felt quite isolated. Yeah. I needed something, right? Yeah. So at the time, I said, well, we need an on-campus presence. So I co-founded as a president the uh, Association of Students of African Descent. Yeah. This is at Simon Fraser. This is at Simon Fraser University. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at uh, U of T, just getting to mm -hmm. sort of the research area, uh, my last two years I did work using a technique called Raman spectroscopy. It was a USRA. Um. Right. This is a common uh, thread with a lot of our Canadian uh, guests here. This uh, USRA is a critical undergraduate student research awards. <laughs> yes. So the first uh, year, I used that technique to study high temperature superconductors and yeah. synthesize uh, superconductors myself, which is basically like a process of baking yeah um, annealing i think is the fancy word right <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so interestingly the, the phd student at the time Ayrton martin we collaborate now okay um, because we're now using raman as a tool f to analyze biological systems right and raman spectroscopy is basically you're shooting uh photons at a piece of matter and looking at the scattering and learning something about its structure? Yeah, so Raman spectroscopy, if you have ever used a uh, laser pointer, you're actually doing a Raman <laughs> spectroscopy experiment. <laughs> but the only thing that we have in the lab that's different is, um, you know, when you shine that light at the wall, uh, what you see is the same color reflected back. Right? But if you were to block that with a filter, that particular color, and if we change your retina to a very highly sensitive detector, like a charge-coupled device or CCD, mm -hmm. you would see different colors at longer wavelengths. So sure. if you shone a green light, you'd see, in some instances, red, orange, yellow. And if you then took a CD, you take it outside, you'd see the spectrum of colors. Well, in the same way, um, we can separate the colors using a grating, which is a CD, on the back mm -hmm. of a CD, the lines that are etched. And so that's Raman spectroscopy. And the set of colors is unique to the compound that you're illuminating, right? The Raman spectroscopy gives you a spectral fingerprint of the material. The only problem with the well, one of the problems with the technique is that it's very weak, right? Yes. So what we do in our lab is um, we use metal nanoparticles to enhance the light scattering in order to uh, be able to detect that weak uh, spectral fingerprint. Um, mm -hmm. And you mentioned, you know, that original work you were doing it with different super types conductors. of superconductors, yeah. right? Which is, I'm assuming, that's a very organized, consistent material. And now you're trying to do this work with uh, biological tissues, for lack of a better word. It sounds like that must be very challenging to know what you're looking at as you move around in the material. So transitioning from um, what we would call hard condensed matter to mm -hmm. soft condensed matter, uh, that transition occurred in 2008. So I wanted to transition to um, research that 
would have, you know, health benefits, which sure. would positively impact health. And so Raman spectroscopy at the time, we were moving into using these nanoparticles to overcome that problem of a weakly scattered light. Mm -hmm. And so that really pushed the field to be, you know, viable for uh, understanding biological systems. Because up until that point, fluorescence was the main sort of optical technique that was used in biology, but now you could do it with Raman. And so biological systems, are, as you know, you've just said, are much more complex, right? They're not these ordered structures. But that's what makes the use of these nanoparticles really critical, because one of the first things we did was to target a receptor that's on all of our cells called the epidermal growth factor receptor. So that receptor mediates cell growth and differentiation. It's overexpressed by, you know, a factor of 10 on cells that are cancerous. Okay. So, you know, we know that cancerous cells grow and divide rapidly. Uh, so many different cancers have this overexpression of epidermal growth factor receptor. So we wanted to, um, first of all, image that overexpression. So we tagged nanoparticles with the natural ligand for EGFR, and that is EGF, <laughs> epidermal growth factor, okay. and showed that you know it binds and we can sure. track it, we can image its location. And so one of the, the next important contributions recently published to also attach to this uh, nanoparticle an agent that would allow for treatment. So just to get it clear in my mind here, you have a ligand that you know is going to attach to this, this receptor. Yeah. Attached to the ligand is a nanoparticle, which is like just a single gold atom or something like that, a single yeah. atom of a metal, a, big, yes. a bigger thing. Yeah. And then now you're talking about putting some sort of treatment delivery also on this kind of uh, right. microscopic spaceship. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I like the terminology <laughs> micros. So nanoscopic uh, yes. yeah, spaceship. Actually, yeah, yeah, I say, yeah. uh, so we showed that this, what we call now, particle that has dual function of therapy and diagnosis, right? right. A theranostic particle. Mm -hmm could really um, be effective in treating triple negative breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And so this is where, you know, I want to describe how I'm pursuing a work that's related to health outcomes for African Canadians, okay. people of African descent. Uh, so triple negative breast cancer disproportionately affects black women. You could see the distribution for example, in Brazil, mm -hmm. is predominantly in areas where Afro-Brazilians are in the majority. Researchers at uh, McMaster University, Juliet Daniel, has tied it to a gene called Kaiso. And if you're from the Caribbean, mm -hmm. you'll know what Kaiso means. It's sort of short form for Calypso. And so we showed that in cell culture, this theranostic particle can um, kill the triple negative breast cancer cells while keeping the normal cells healthy. Sure. So that's one area. A, a more recent area is pursuing an understanding of vitamin D and uterine fibroids. These are uh, non-cancerous tumors in the uterus, and it disproportionately affects black women, two to three times in that respect, and the symptoms are worse. So we're collaborating with them to uh, uh, develop a diagnostic uh, for vitamin D, because vitamin D is uh, inversely correlated with the appearance of uterine fibroids. Okay. And vitamin D, for those, you know, who have uh, melanin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, melanin is protective in regions where you have a lot of sunlight, protective against uh, skin cancer. Sure. But there's not a lot of uh, remaining UV light around <laughs> to sick. create vitamin D. Right. And so there's a deficiency there. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is an under-researched, underfunded area that was recognized by CIHR just last year. Okay. And so we're 
pursuing that, to develop a diagnostic tool so that it's accessible to individuals as a point of care tool in the same way that you would have a blood pressure monitor sure. at home or you could use your own non-traditional methods to monitor vitamin D. So I, I would say the work now is uh, uh, relevant to me, mm-hmm. uh, relevant to my community. Yeah. Yeah, and and of course along the way a big part of my experience, you know, is that I was always sort of the only black person in the room. Yeah. At conferences in in the classroom, so a, a big motivating factor for me is to make things better for the next generation. Sure. Obviously, that's been an important part of your career, right? Like you've talked about, both in the community and within academia. Do you ever encounter, for instance, going too far, being tokenized as the only black person? Does it ever give you trouble in the other direction? So uh, I would say if you're the only one, you're both hyper-visible and invisible at times. Hyper-visible because, you know, if they want a representative on a search committee to tick that diversity box, oh, here, here you are. But You know, around the table where decisions are being made, you become invisible. Mm -hmm. Your contributions are either not acknowledged or they're taken by somebody else. Right. You know, because of my experience in that respect, that's why, since I can remember, I've always been interested in um, encouraging that next generation to pursue uh, physics first, but, (laughs) you know, secondly, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I've built lots of organizations. And so when I was in my final year at uh, Simon Fraser, I mentioned forming those two organizations, but I I thought it would be good to marry my community Mm -hmm. development interests with my field of physics and so we we held the first Imhotep's Legacy Academy event and it was called uh, Seeing is Believing. So we dissected a cow eye to understand, you know, the structure of the eye and how you see. For the younger kids we had kaleidoscopes. So then when I came to uh, Dalhousie, I really you know, look to Nova Scotia as the mecca of the black experience, yeah. right? The historic mm-hmm. uh, presence here uh, for over 400 years. Um, I said, well, let me bring my science expertise and maybe we could take Imhotep to another level. Yeah. So we, you know, rolled out in 2003 what became... Uh, this huge now suite of 30 programs within the Emotep's Legacy Academy yeah. uh, serve in the province. So I should mention this. For two years of my graduate career, yeah. I was doing community work. Sure. Literally, I was most of the time doing some sort of community work. and mm-hmm. uh, But the other thing that limited me to that two years was you know, my mom was uh, quite sick at the time. The cancer had taken hold, and um, she said, "Kev, you gotta, you gotta finish because yeah. you know, as an immigrant parent, someone who sacrificed, you know, her entire life for uh, her children, uh, seeing seeing them graduate is the greatest reward." So. Mm-hmm. So I um, stepped away from that community work to um, to double down on finishing the thesis. And um, so I was able to finish it. Uh, she came out to uh, Vancouver to be there for my graduation in a wheelchair. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and um, a, m- a month later, uh, she passed. And... Um, <laughs> And it's as though she was, you know, holding out to, yeah, yeah. It's the, you know, best reward I could could give her. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, her her life, her example, mm-hmm. is what I follow and what I, yeah, try to instill in my kids. So yeah, there's something very lovely about 
her telling you to finish up your degree as well, right? That yeah. sort of last uh, bit of of parenting, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I have four wonderful kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, they of course are exposed to a lot of uh, science activities. Yeah. <laughs> uh, whether or not they like it, um, you know, they're all um, passionate about what they do, and I I must say that the rewards of Seeing uh, my kids grow up is similar to the rewards that I see when um, participants in our Imhotep's Legacy yeah. Academy program, where some of the students are describing what they want to be, and um, and seeing them, you know, nine or ten years later, actually graduating with that sure. exact degree, it's just yeah. um, uh, so rewarding. So. Mm-hmm. I have a question, maybe maybe almost a bit of a selfish question, I think, about your role as uh, associate dean of, of EDI. And I'm wondering, are you starting to kind of take all of these life experiences and formulate them into, you know, uh, advice for people like me, other professors that are relatively junior, how to make concrete decisions to improve um, EDIA, especially in uh, the physical sciences? You know, I think often we mistake what EDI is, uh, but, you know, I like to list it as DEI. So diversity is, you know, this set of identities mm-hmm. and um, experiences that are in the room, Yeah, right? It's a fact. Equity is a process uh, of identifying barriers uh, for access by... Uh, various equity deserving groups. So, you know, as a faculty member, we have to be doing that process of identifying within our own area of responsibility Mm -hmm. what those barriers are. And there's lots of resources out there. So we will be providing some of that moving forward. And then inclusion is an outcome where all of those equity deserving groups feel that they belong, they can bring their whole selves. And this is often where we have an issue because we set out these plans and we're like, oh, we're doing this, that, and the other thing. And we sort of assume the outcome. Right, right. (laughs) When in fact, the outcome can only be measured by surveying those equity deserving group members. You know, I realize, number one, that it takes more than an individual. Mm -hmm. takes many hands on deck in order to accomplish this. And that's why we're starting with education, starting with Faculty of Science Equity Champion Program. Mm -hmm. And so that involves training. So right now there are 30 um, faculty, staff, and students who are involved in um, an EDI training certificate. There'll be a second round like this next year. So these EDI champions are partners in this effort. You know, there'll be a, a group who are represent different identities, different disciplines, mm-hmm. uh, in order to help each department yeah. uh, bring that EDI perspective to their research, teaching, as... African proverb says, you know, you can go fast alone. Mm-hmm where you can go far together. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. It's been very interesting, and I appreciate talking to you. Thank you for for having me. Um, it was a, a great chat, and thanks for uh, bringing the emotion to <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for making me cry today. <laughs> <laughs> In our final episode of Season 5, we'll talk to Dr. William Burt. He's a Dalhousie Oceanography alum and the chief ocean scientist with Planetary Technologies, an industry partner working with Dow to research an ocean-focused climate solution. I'm your host, David Barkley. Thanks for listening. Dalgraphies is brought to you by Dalhousie University's Faculty of Science and CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Our producer is Nicole Killowy. You can learn more about sciographies at dal.ca slash sciographies.